Welcome to the Earth Observing Laboratories seminar series. My name is Jörn Jensen. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today, ASP and EOL's Dr. Mampi Sakar. Mampi has a Bachelor's of Science in Physics, Mathematics and Computer Science from St. Xavier's College in Kolkata. She has a Master's of Science in Geophysics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Karakpur, a Master's of Technology in Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, a Master's in Meteorology and Physical Oceanography from uh, University of Miami. And finally, last year, she received her PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Miami. I think it's fair to say that uh, Mampi is one of the most degreed persons I have ever met. For her work, uh, Dr. Sakar worked on analysis and modeling of data from the CSET field program. This data set was obtained in the stratocumulus to trade cumulus transition between California and Hawaii. In 2020, she joined ASP as a postdoc. Since joining us, she has also been involved in work on water isotopes with her EOL mentor, Dr. Adriana Bailey. Today, we are using Slido to post questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. The Slido window is located at the bottom of the presentation screen. Please do not be alarmed if you cannot see your question, because we are collecting all questions uh, and they will be revealed during the question and answer session of the talk at the end of the seminar. Dr. Mampi, we welcome you and the virtual stage is yours. Hi, hi everyone. Can you see me, Jan? Yes, we do, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, thank you everyone for joining me today. Thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Pakita Swidema from the University of Miami. Uh, thereafter, I would also like to thank um, Bruce Albrecht, Peter Minit, and Brand Mips from University of Miami, Jan Henson from here at NCAR, uh, Virendra Ghatte at Argonne National Lab, uh, Hans Norman, Rob Wood from University of Washington. They all have helped me um, through my PhD career in uh, one way or the other. Um, so today I will be talking about the work that I conducted during my PhD and also before uh, joining NCAR. Um, and the topic uh, for my talk is uh, influence of precipitation during stratocumulus to cumulus transition over Pacific Ocean. Um, okay. So the initial motivation came from the satellite pictures uh, as shown here on the left hand side uh, goes 15 satellite uh, images have been obtained from the catalogs map website of NCAR uh, in which we can see that uh, the unbroken sheet of uh, uh, stratocumulus cloud um, near the coast of California is uh, transitioning uh, towards the trade wind uh, direction uh, and uh, going towards Hawaii. Uh, and on its way, it's transitioning into uh, more broken and uh, uh, scattered uh, uh, layers of cumulus. And uh, this, uh, this transition uh, has a global impact. Uh, it it has uh, it it is a, a striking feature of uh, our global uh, cloud climatology. Um, the change in local albedo associated with uh, this transition uh, in the cloud uh, configuration uh, has a, a tremendous impact on the radiative. Uh, balance of the atmosphere. However, the uh, existing models have uh, certain difficulties uh, in capturing and representing this transition quite well, uh, which is uh, mostly due to the unavailability of uh, high resolution observations 
And uh, with that goal kept in mind uh, in 2015, uh, between July and August, uh, the cloud system evolution in the trades or CSET mission was conducted. Uh, the aim was to study the uh, stratocumulus to cumulus transition between California and Hawaii. <clears throat> Um, as shown on the uh, right hand side, the upper picture shows uh, the, tra the aircraft trajectory as the, um, as the air parcels were sampled while the uh, Gulfstream 5 aircraft from NSF NCAR uh, moved from California on its uh, way to Hawaii uh, on the first day. Uh, the green lines here show the uh, air parcel trajectories, which uh, were obtained from the high split uh, uh, model. Uh, and uh, using those, the air parcels uh, were resampled two days later um, as they reached uh, more equatorward, uh, while the GV or the Gulfstream 5 aircraft moved back from Hawaii to California as shown on the bottom picture. Uh, so the Gulfstream 5 was used to conduct 15 such uh, research flights to and from California, uh, I'm sorry, to and from uh, California uh, and uh, comprehensive in situ as well as remote sensing uh, observations were collected uh, during this uh, campaign and uh, if uh, you are interested, uh, there is an overview, a CSET overview paper in the BAMS uh, of 2019 by <clears throat> Albrecht et al. Uh, uh, you can refer to that for a detailed uh, uh, description of this mission. Uh, now, this uh, the cloud transition. Uh, is popularly explained using the uh, deepening warming decoupling paradigm uh, as coined by Bretherton and Vaughan in 1997. Uh, primarily, uh, this, uh, this uh, theory says uh, that like, as uh, the SST increases uh, from the subtropical to tropical uh, latitudes, the uh, the trade wind uh, uh, in the, in the trade wind direction and the convectively driven turbulence from the surface uh, increases and uh, that also then strengthens the entrainment mixing uh, happening at the cloud top where the free uh, tropospheric uh, dry air is uh, entraining at the cloud top thereby thinning out the stratocumulus uh, layer um, and uh, the uh, and the boundary layer uh, becomes uh, deeper and uh, uh, soon it becomes uh, very difficult for the cloud layer to remain well mixed uh, throughout the boundary layer. So, um, and in the meantime, uh, due to the increase in surface moisture fluxes with the, uh, due to the increase uh, in SST, uh, cumulus clouds start to form um, with, um, and, and they try to uh, uh, resupply moisture to the stratocumulus uh, index, but um, ultimately the stratocumulus uh, layers thin out and dissipate, uh, which lives behind only the trade cumulus. Uh, so that has been shown in this uh, schematic uh, quite uh, well. Uh, the radiative effect, uh, the surface effect, um, they have been shown here, uh, but little focus has been given on rain uh, and not only in this uh, schematic but also in many earlier studies uh, in many modeling studies um, where rain was not uh, found to be a strong influencer in causing this transition um, however there are other modeling and observational work which suggest that precipitation can in fact uh, hasten the transition. Um, for example, in 1991, Palu Chan-Lenshaw through an observational study uh, showed that uh, the uh, the uh, raindrop evaporation in the subcloud uh, layer uh, can in fact uh, stabilize the uh, in the subcloud layer with respect to cloud layer and thereby uh, 
producing a, a stable configuration, which uh, then discourages the transport of moisture to cloud layer and then uh, aiding the cloud transition. Similarly, and more recently, uh, Yamaguchi et al. in 2017, uh, O et al. at uh, 2018 um, showed uh, the microphysical impact uh, um, which, uh, which aided the depletion of the stratocumulus uh, layers. Uh, so my objective was to see if the CSET observations can help us in uh, seeing any signature of uh, the precipitation uh, influence over the pace of the cloud transition. Um, and that was not a surprising question, given that we uh, sampled a lot of precipitation uh, during the CSET mission. Uh, the four pictures uh, over here have been obtained from the front camera of the Gulfstream 5. Uh, they show uh, clouds on 19 July, where uh, many cumulus uh, regions have been sampled. Um, and the results uh, in, in all these cases can be seen reaching the surface. Um, this is how a typical radar contour uh, of reflectivity looked like. The top image is for a stratocumulus uh, deck. Uh, the bottom is for a cumulus deck. And um, as uh, as we can see here, uh, the DBZ, uh, any, any DBZ more than minus 10, so uh, pinkish to yellowish colors, uh, they, they uh, show drizzle activities uh, which um, are reaching the surface and almost uh, reaching the surface, uh, not only in the cumulus, but also the stratocumulus. So uh, there had been a lot of precipitation uh, and that has been sampled by the uh, radar. Um, so uh, I will be addressing two questions. Uh, first, uh, if there is any influence of precipitation on cloud transition, uh, which can be, uh, which can be um, detected through uh, this CSET observation. And secondly, I would uh, see if uh, see if, um, or investigate the accuracy of the rain rate retrievals in the shallow marine clouds using the CSET observations. So uh, 15 research flights were conducted and uh, each flight uh, composed of uh, was composed of uh, four or five modules each, and each module uh, was uh, some uh, uh, was shaped something like this. Um, the module included an above cloud leg, uh, an in cloud leg, a leg which uh, sampled the atmosphere very close to the uh, surface at about uh, 150 meter level or near surface. And there were uh, long vertical legs which sampled, uh, which, which transacted through uh, cloud, cloudy atmosphere. So uh, with that in mind, um, and uh, in my uh, toolbox, uh, I used the approach of selecting only the cases where the transitions were actually uh, taking place from stratocumulus to cumulus. And I found three such flight pairs, so six fl uh, flights um, in, where the stratocumulus uh, was transitioning into cumulus as verified from the uh, radar images, radar and LIDAR, uh, and also the GOES satellite images. Um, and the primary uh, instrument observations that I have been using for my uh, research was uh, the in-situ two-dimensional optical array cloud probe, uh, which uh, measures the microphysical changes in terms of the raindrop size distribution. Uh, the um, size of the drops uh, varied from 75 micron to 3.2 millimeter. So it uh, um, it uh, covers the range from uh, small drizzle drops to uh, large raindrops. Um, I, uh, and then um, finally, I identified the cloud transitions using uh, the hourly GOES-15 infrared data. Uh, in that, uh, I uh, 
identified the cloud transition uh, and assigned it at the beginning of a five hour period in which the cloud fraction continuously remains below 0 0.5. Uh, so this is how the first flight pair where the uh, transition took place looked like. Uh, the stratocumulus uh, reflectivity uh, contours are shown on the left, um, in which uh, the clouds are reaching up to about 800 meter uh, height. The conditions were pristine with uh, the cloud drop concentration of about 22 per cc. Uh, the clouds were strongly precipitating with uh, uh, some uh, samples uh, reaching uh, towards the surface um, and uh, the mean rain rate of this uh, 10 minute leg was 1.2 millimeter per hour which is quite high compared to um, other similar stratocumulus conditions um, this uh, stratocumulus transitioned into cumulus structure as uh, shown on the right hand side uh, here uh, the cumulus evolved into two kilometer um, heights so uh, and uh, uh, a very interesting feature that we found here was uh, the uh, the clouds that we sampled here were ultra clean uh, in which uh, the nd reduced to one per cc, uh, uh, and um, they were um, on top of the decoupled boundary layers mostly. Um, and if, uh, and uh, would et al in 2018 have done uh, detailed analysis um, and used a modeling approach to understand this uh, process. So that's a good reference if you are interested. And um, uh, the rain rate also intensified from the stratocumulus to cumulus. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the second flight pair. In this, uh, the stratocumulus was uh, much different from the first case uh, as, the, uh, as the layer was uh, very polluted with ND of about 224 per cc. Uh, that was uh, due to the forest fires uh, which were going on in Oregon at that time. Uh, the precipitation is reaching the surface um, and it, but it is quite light compared to the first um, flight pair example. Uh, the cloud tops are um, quite high at about 1.2 kilometer. This stratocumulus is transitioning into this broken uh, cumulus structure, um, even though the frequency uh, of the uh, cloud detection is quite high. Um, uh, the conditions uh, have um, cleaned up uh, after, maybe, um, most likely because of the precipitation uh, and uh, such that the ND has reduced to about 22 per cc from 224. Uh, there has been an increase in the rain rate and uh, the cloud top is reaching uh, up to about 1.8 kilometer. And this is the final case uh, and this is in contrast to the other two uh, cases where the precipitation activity was much more defined and uh, it was uh, reaching the surface. Um, but in this, uh, this flight pair, what we saw is that the condition was quite pristine, uh, both in the beginning and at the end uh, with uh, ND remaining constant uh, at about 22 per cc. Uh, precipitation did not reach the surface and uh, clouds uh, evolved from 1200 to 1800 meter. So uh, out of these three, uh, there were two cases where we witnessed uh, the precipitation cleansing of the cloud layer. Uh, next, uh, in, or, uh, in order to investigate the role of microphysics in causing the transition, I used the uh, raindrop size distribution from the uh, 2DC uh, cloud probe. Um, and uh, I have used, um, I have shown the drop, con the concentration of the raindrops on the y axis along uh, the uh, diameter on the uh, on the x-axis. Uh, the stratocumulus cases have been shown on the left, uh, cumulus on the right. Um, the black dots are for the observations which were made uh, near the surface, and the green dots are for the observations which were made uh, within the cloud, in the cloud. Um, and uh, the blue and the red lines uh, are the exponential and logarithmic fit 
uh, respectively, uh, which have been fit over these observations. Um, and uh, the log normal fitting um, have been doing much better job at uh, representing the DSDs as compared to the exponential fit. Uh, this is a fact which we will be using later. Um, but the most important thing uh, to see here uh, is that the drop size distribution uh, is uh, shifting towards larger uh, drop sizes uh, along the transition. So as, uh, the, um, as, the, as the air parcels uh, evolved from stratocumulus to cumulus, the, uh, small, and the small drop sizes, um, the, sorry, the small drops, the raindrops are reduced while the larger drops increased. So uh, that shows an involvement of microphysics uh, in, uh, in, uh, in causing the transition. Uh, looking at the changes in the subcloud layer, uh, the uh, near surface relative humidity uh, was uh, plot, no, is uh, shown here, plotted uh, along the transition um, towards the west. And uh, most, com most uh, commonly, the relative humidity is decreasing. Uh, this decrease was also confirmed by uh, higher uh, cloud bases obtained from LIDAR. And uh, the decreasing relative humidity is also consistent with more entrainment at cloud top, uh, which, uh, uh, um, which uh, would only uh, help in aiding the uh, cloud transition. Uh, one dimensional uh, subcloud evaporation model was used, uh, which was initialized using the in situ data. And uh, what that indicated uh, is that the subcloud evaporation increased uh, along the uh, transition uh, with the maxima of the uh, evaporation occurring near the surface. So, the the next question um, the, the following question that i addressed is uh, if precipitation um, that we sampled in these three flight pairs is uh, uh, is correlated with the uh, transition the pace of the transition and for that uh, i have calculated the number of hours uh, uh, that each of the cases are taking uh, to a uh, transition from stratocumulus to cumulus. Uh, the number of hours to transition has been, uh, uh, has been uh, obtained from the IR derived cloud fraction. Um, I have uh, got the cloud fraction, I have got calculated the cloud fraction within one by one uh, grid uh, boxes. And uh, whenever the cloud fraction remained uh, below 0 0.5 for five subsequent hours, I, um, calculated that as the number of hours it took to transition. So uh, the number of hours has been shown on the y-axis The and the change in um, the rain rate uh, before and after uh, the transition has been shown on the uh, x-axis. Um, and what we found is that the cases where uh, there was uh, very little uh, change in rain rate, uh, transition slower, taking more than 30 hours, compared to the cases uh, as shown here in the box, uh, in which the rain, uh, the change in rain rate is very high. Uh, and uh, it is only taking uh, 12 hours or even less than that to make those transition. So there is a correlation found even uh, with uh, this, um, the nine cases that we uh, analyzed and uh, there, uh, they, using these observations, there, was, there is a signal of uh, precipitation correlated with the hastening of the transition. However, um, we also found that the precipitation was correlated very well uh, with the boundary layer depth as well. So I mean, um, using just observations, it is quite difficult to discern an independent effect of precipitation alone on the transition and uh, further modeling studies will be necessary to uh, ascertain uh, any such results. Um, Next, um, I 
tried to uh, clarify the airborne 94 gigahertz radar retrieved precipitation in these uh, shallow marine clouds as observed during CSET. Um, so, uh, so the primary uh, ways, uh, like uh, two common ways of uh, obtaining rain rates uh, are, uh, the first one is uh, using an instrument like 2DC as uh, shown on the left-hand side. Um, uh, and uh, the other way is to use the remote sensing of instruments like uh, the HCR, 90, uh, which is the 94 gigahertz radar, and the HSRL, which is the 532 nanometer LIDAR. Um, so retrieval uh, algorithms are made based on the radar and li LIDAR, such as in Swartz et al. 2019 paper. And uh, using the, this algorithm, uh, rain rates are retrieved. Um, what motivated me uh, was the question uh, that even uh, uh, like my motivation behind uh, you know, studying the rain rate more in more details was that uh, when I tried to compare the in situ obtained rain frequency uh, with the uh, radar lidar uh, retrieved rain frequency, then in most of the flights uh, during uh, CSET, the in situ rain frequencies were higher. Um, and this is despite the fact that uh, the radar and LIDAR have uh, higher uh, sampling volume of air that they can uh, sample at a point of time compared to in situ. Uh, plus the in situ um, sampling frequency was also um, smaller compared to uh, the radar LIDAR rain. Um, retrieval. So, um, so that, uh, uh, that was an interesting question. And uh, so uh, next, what I did was uh, compare the so this, uh, so on the left hand side, the rain rate has been shown um, for the in situ 2DC probe uh, on a horizontal level leg where the flight was flying um, at 150 meter uh, altitude near surface uh, and the radar and lidar was pointing upward um, so the black lines are for the in situ observations which have been obtained at 150 meter level and the blue line is for the uh, lowest gate that the LIDAR and radar retrievers uh, sampled, um, uh, which was at about 300 meter. So uh, there is a, so in situ observations are clearly showing much higher rain rate than the radar LIDAR retrie uh, retrievers. Uh, now, uh, th there is a possibility that uh, collision coalescence uh, between the in cloud level um, and towards uh, the uh, 150 meter level leg would uh, cause an increase in rain rate. But in doing so, uh, the concentration of drops would uh, decrease because of the, uh, the, the drops coalescing together. But that's not what we saw when we uh, compared the total concentration for the same two observations. Um, and so uh, there has to be more than collision coalescence, which uh, is leading to uh, the in-situ observations, the in-situ rain rates being much higher than the uh, LIDAR radar perceived rain rates. Um, so in order to understand that more, um, I delved into the uh, retrieval mechanism more. So this retrieval, um, as detailed in Swartz et al, uh, 2019, uh, is based on the HCR reflectivity, the HCR spectral width, and the HSRL backscatter coefficient. Um, and they use an untruncated uh, gamma distribution assumption for the underlying um, raindrop size distribution. Uh, the the untruncated uh, so the uh, so there are three components of uh, 
three unknown parameters in the gamma distribution, uh, as shown in this equation. The three uh, parameters are NW, which is the normalized concentration, D0 is the median volume diameter, and mu is the shape parameter. Um, so a decrease of a decreasing uh, mu or the decreasing shape parameter uh, indicates uh, the DSD getting wider. Um, so keeping this in mind, uh, we also looked at the limitations that uh, this uh, retrieval uh, has. Uh, the first one is that the uh, there is a threshold uh, um, being used in the uh, scheme where the ratio of the reflectivity and the backscatter um, has to be greater uh, than 3 dB. Um, otherwise, uh, the samples are filtered out uh, due to uh, high aerosol loading conditions. But in that process, uh, in the weak results which have backscatter comparable with the uh, the and the high aerosol loading also gets filtered out so that's uh, that was the limitation the second is that the lidar gets attenuated in high drizzling conditions so um, the retrievals are not quite possible in those uh, conditions the third is that the aircraft motion has an effect on the hcr spectral width um, and therefore there can be additional uncertainty so these three limitations uh were kept in mind and uh, maybe they are the reason behind uh, the mismatch of the rain frequency uh, but uh, we also looked at the algorithm uh, by which the uh, retrieval was working. So the algorithm was first used by O'Connor in 2005. Um, and there are three main equations. The first one on the top, uh, here uh, the, the ratio of the HCR reflectivity and spectral width is used. Um, and mu, which is the shape parameter, is initially assumed to be zero. And using that, um, an initial value of D0 is obtained. Now, this initial uh, D0 is then fed into the second equation. And uh, we uh, know the spectral width from the radar and thereby we then determine mu. And then this preliminary mu is then again fed into the first equation. And then this loop continues until a suitable value of mu and D naught is reached. Uh, thereafter, uh, these two uh, parameters are fed into this third equation uh, where uh, the uh, HCR reflectivity is used on the left hand side and uh, using the uh, the determined D naught and mu uh, and NW, which is the normalized drop concentration uh, is determined. And finally, using all these three parameters uh, for the gamma distribution, we obtain the rain rate. Uh, now, uh, we speculated that there can be uh, three, three, uh, three reasons why uh, we saw the uh, inaccuracy in uh, getting the uh, the obs uh, the true fr uh, frequency in the rain uh, in the rain rate. Uh, Retrievals. So the first one can uh, that we analyzed is gamma fitting. The second is me scattering. Um, these two factors were primary, and uh, the the third uh, factor that we analyzed was raindrop attenuation. Uh, so looking at the accuracy of gamma fitting, the assumption of gamma fitting uh, working for all the all the clouds. Uh, uh, that we observed during CSET. Uh, were, uh, I, I, for that, I again used the raindrop size distribution from 2DC. Uh, and I have splitted uh, the cloud conditions into four parts. Uh, the stratocumulus is uh, shown for in cloud level and at 150 meter level. Uh, 
And uh, in the bottom, the two, and the two plots are for 150 meter level cumulus and in cloud level cumulus. The gamma parameters have been shown on the uh, plots, on each plot. Um, so the, the uh, sky blue color is the fitting of the gamma. Red is for log normal and blue is for exponential. Um, and uh, the blue line, as, as the exponential and the log normal fit, both have been truncated at either ends. And uh, the, the gamma fit here uh, has not been truncated uh, following the uh, retrieval approach. So uh, what, uh, what was interesting is that gamma fitting is working really well for both the stratocumulus cases uh, and also for the cumulus uh, clouds, uh, which are sampled at in cloud level. The gamma fitting is doing very well uh, in that the D naught is uh, increasing towards the surface from in cloud to 150 meter level um, that, uh, that uh, indicates uh, collision coalescence growth um, the mu is also uh, increasing towards the surface, uh, which should mean that the DSD is getting narrower, and that can be can also be explained by the uh, by the collision coalescence uh, process and uh, the size shorting. Um, however, uh, if we look uh, closely at the cumulus case for one, uh, 150 meter level, where most of the precipitation was. Um, observed there uh, the untruncated gamma line which is the sky blue line is not working very well uh, it is underestimating the the distribution and uh, uh, noticing that mu is zero uh, so a gamma fit where mu is zero is essentially an exponential fit uh, but uh, the exponential fit, which is uh, the truncated exponential fit, which is shown in blue, still does not match with the uh, the untruncated gamma fit line here. And uh, so um, this possibly might be uh, so. So one thing that can be done in future is to try and use a truncated gamma uh, fitting. Uh, so, um, because a lack of truncation in the gamma fit uh, might be contributing to the overall underestimation of the concentration, uh, at least uh, in the cumulus clouds where we saw most of the precipitation. So that can be one of the factors. The second one that uh, uh, was uh, uh, interesting was me scattering, the effect of me scattering. So um, the drops, the raindrops that we sampled during CSET was uh, uh, much bigger. Uh, like um, we we sampled uh, drops uh, of about uh, one millimeter um, uh, very frequently. And uh, what why? And that's one of the reasons why me scattering becomes important during CSET because. Um, me scattering essentially is when the drop size is uh, almost um, equal or slightly greater than the wavelength of incident light. The incident light in our case is the radar wavelength of 3.2 millimeter. Uh, so when this condition uh, is met, then what happens is that the backscatter, uh, uh, the backscatter radiation that the radar is uh, receiving is uh, damped as uh, as most of the light is scattering forward so this if if we don't um, take care of the dampening that's happening then uh, we might have a problem of underestimation of rain uh, as has been shown uh, in this plot where i use the in situ observations to plot a z r uh, scatter plot uh, the blue uh, dots are for when the uh, me scattering is not considered and red dots are for when the me scattering is considered. So when the raindrops are small uh, and the rain rates are uh, smaller than one millimeter per hour, then uh, me correction doesn't make any difference. But uh, when the rain rates are much higher, then uh, there, is a, there is a dampening 
here. And uh, this dampening can propagate in the form of an underestimation of uh, the rain rate compared to the true or the in-situ rain rate uh, based on uh, power uh, law RZ equation. And that's something that we saw when we compared the, so, so sigma um, gamma prime, which is the ratio between the, the me reflectivity and uh, Rayleigh reflectivity. Uh, so the, the values of gamma prime is much higher for the radar LIDAR retrieval compared to the in-situ to DC. So that, uh, that can be a reason uh, of underestimation of the rain rates. So uh, after, uh, after we uh, saw this mismatch um, or, uh, so uh, we, we uh, got in touch with uh, the Virendra, uh, with, with uh, Virendra Ghate at ANL and uh, an improvement was made uh, last year in the radar LIDAR retrieval. Uh, and I refer to that as uh, version two. Um, the NCAR team, along with Virendra Ghate, uh, improved the retrievals uh, and uh, three uh, major uh, things which were improved were, first, the calibration of the HCR was improved based on the ocean backscatter for each of the CZ flights. Uh, then uh, the water vapor attenuation was also accounted for. And uh, finally, the meek scattering coefficients were also improved. And when this uh, new version of retrieval was applied um, and then compared with the in-situ observation, then the rain rate significantly increased uh, compared to version one, which is shown in blue. And, uh, but, but the rain rate is uh, still quite lower than the in-situ observations. So uh, we tried an alternative approach in which we used the HCR reflectivity, uh, the HCR Doppler velocity, and, the, and we constrained uh, the, uh, the mathematics with uh, the use of in-situ observations. So this uh, approach of using Doppler velocity and reflectivity was uh, uh, earlier also used by Williams in 2002 for 32.75 centimeter radar and later uh, also and more uh, recently by Mason et al in 2017 who used it for the 94, 90, 94 gigahertz radar as well. Uh, the advantage of using Doppler velocity is that the me scattering effect uh, uh, is much smaller uh, does not affect Doppler velocity as much as it affects the radar reflectivity. We have um, you know, confirmed that using the, uh, the, the this uh, the CZ flight observations. Um, the other advantage is that the that when a log normal distribution is assumed, uh, then the Doppler velocity does not have the dependence on the uh, total raindrop concentration. So that's an added advantage. Um, so we have assumed a log normal distribution underlying the, uh, the, in the raindrop size distribution. Uh, log normal distribution has three parameters that are unknown. The first one is the sigma, which is the width of log normal distribution. Uh, mu is related to the geometrical uh, diameter um, and n naught n naught here uh, is the total raindrop concentration. So uh, sigma here, uh, we obtained that from the in-situ observations and we held that as um, constant because it was not changing much with height. Um, so um, having obtained sigma from in-situ, we now reduce the problem from um, problem to two unknowns and two knowns. The two knowns are uh, reflectivity and uh, Doppler velocity, and the two unknowns are uh, mu and n naught. And then uh, 
a lookup table is arranged for mu and in naught uh, with suitable ranges. And uh, based on that, the minimum square difference between modeled and observed V and Z, we, we determined the mu and naught and the strain rates. And the Doppler velocity led rain rate has been shown here in green, and that's uh, slightly higher than the version two, uh, but still less than the in situ observations. Uh, this is this is how the uh, contours looked like for rain rate. The left hand side is for the ZVD method. The middle one is for Z beta method uh, from version two, and the last one is. The, the mean, the uh, time averaged mean along the altitude. Uh, the green line shows, uh, the green line shows the mean for uh, the uh, ZVD method and the red line is for Z beta method. But there, uh, the limitations uh, in this approach is that the, the high dependence, the, the dependence of uh, reflectivity on sixth power of the drop size. So even if uh, there is a small uncertainty in the drop size that can propagate in a big way in the uh, while calculating the rain rates. Second is that error analysis has not been done uh, in this study, um, but can be done for future um, campaigns. Um, and the constant uh, value of sigma uh, with height uh, has been assumed here, but that can also be improved in later studies. Um, after we submitted the paper, we got an interesting uh, feedback from a reviewer who was interested in knowing if the raindrop attenuation had to do something with the uh, discrepancy in the rain rates that we were seeing. And so uh, using the gradient method from Fair et al. Uh, in 2018 paper, um, I, I used uh, the, the radar, uh, the, the vertical sampling of the radar reflectivity and Doppler velocity and uh, made a correction, a slight correction. It was not uh, the, the correction uh, in the reflectivity was not very huge. It was of about um, one to two uh, dBZ, but that improved the rain rates from the green line to the magenta line here. And uh, so the uh, when we took uh, attenuation into account, the rain rates further increased. So in, in conclusion, uh, the CSET observations are consistent with the view that precipitation through a quick adjustment to the boundary layer depth, uh, in fact, uh, faci facilitates a hastening of the transition through both thermodynamic and microphysical processes. We uh, sampled three flight pairs where we saw true transitions from stratocumulus to cumulus. Uh, clouds. And uh, within that, we sampled uh, a range of aerosol concentration and boundary layer depths that lended themselves well to uh, assessment and initialization of any further uh, future modeling studies. Um, and the in-situ uh, rain rates that we, uh, uh, that we obtained uh, 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 were quite high. Uh, uh, especially for these stratocumulus uh, clouds. Um, and the underestimated radar LIDAR rain rate retrievals were likely caused by the under, unappreciated me scattering um, and or the inaccurate gamma fitting. Uh, the radar Doppler velocity reflectivity uh, constrained with the in-situ observations uh, can be a uh, an alternative approach that can be uh, used uh, to make more accurate rain rates. And that uh, would uh, do without the use of LIDAR for precipitation analysis by itself. Um, with that, I would like to end my talk and thank you for listening and 
I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saka, for a very interesting talk. So uh, we do have plenty of time here for questions. Uh, please use the Slido interface at the bottom of the presentation screen. And when you type in your question, please also add your actual name. And while we are waiting for uh, questions, well, actually, we already have the first question here. So let us take that. And that question is from Zin Zhu. Uh, Mampi, I have two questions regarding the rain rate comparison. Have you compared the drop size distribution from in situ measurements and the LIDAR radar retrieval? And secondly, does 2DS probe only capable to detect the full drop size distribution spectrum in cloud? Um, thank you, Zinju. Uh, yes, uh, I have compared the DSD between the in situ measurement and the LIDAR radar retrieval. Um, in fact, um, I mean, the comparison cases that I uh, that I showed, the line plots that I showed, uh, that uh, that was for the in situ observation, which were sampled at 150 meter level, and uh, the radar uh, lidar retrievals were made for the same uh, cloud type from the same lake, um, but at the lowest range of the radar lidar retrieval, uh, which were not simultaneous per se. I mean, they, they were not at the same. Uh, space uh, in time, but uh, there was um, like about uh, 150 meter uh, high difference between the two uh, comparisons, but that's the best we could do. Um, and regarding 2DS probe, uh, I, I'm not very sure about the 2DS probe. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, if I'm right, like 2DS probe uh, doesn't sample the bigger uh, raindrops. Uh, it, it, its range is quite limited uh, to um, the small, or maybe like the very few, uh, the, the very small drizzle drops can be sampled by 2DS, but not the bigger ones, if I'm right. Can I make a comment there? Yeah. Uh, which is that uh, as part of the uh, 3V CPI probe, there was two 2DS uh, um, built into it. But uh, by examining the drop size distributions, it looked like there was a significant distortion of the uh, drop size distribution taking place in the 3V CPI. So um, for that reason, it was probably better to use the 2DC probe like what you did, Mampi, um, in the analysis here. Okay, uh, next question. And um, the next question is from uh, Vivek. Since Doppler is a reflectivity weighted terminal velocity and ambient wind, uh, how does the effect of ambient wind, was that considered in the uh, reflectivity and Doppler velocity rain rate estimation method? Okay, um, so the, the example that uh, I showed in my talk, in that the vertical velocity is assumed to be zero. And um, we made this assumption based on the, uh, the uh, comparison of the in-situ obtained vertical velocity um, averaged uh, through the uh, in-situ uh, uh, in, in cloud leg and uh, the, the average 10 minute uh, wind velocity was uh, uh, about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Um, and that when compared with the Doppler velocity, which uh, for uh, stratocumulus uh, cases, uh, the stratocumulus case was uh, three meter per second and for cumulus it was uh, uh, more than five meter per second. Uh, so we thought that uh, this is a pretty fair assumption to make. Uh, uh, but I mean, uh, I, I understand that uh, vertical velocity can have, not in this case, but in other cases where the winds are significantly stronger, it can have an effect. So I, uh, I mean, there is an approach where the mean notch from the uh, radar can be utilized to extract the vertical velocity, but I have not, not done that. 
and uh, yeah, that can be something which can be done. Yes, I had essentially the same question as Vivex here. So, um, yeah. thank you. So, um, other questions? And I don't see that now. So, can I just re, um, return to Vivek's question here? You're yeah. saying that uh, over a 10 minute leg, the average vertical up and down draft is essentially close to zero with a slight offset and so on. Yeah. Uh, but um, you, um, so does it mean that you are calculating an average Doppler velocity over the whole 10 minutes? Or are you, um, in, in a sense, you are having, what is it, two hertz measurements that you're trying to do it from? And um, there might be correlations between uh, downdraft and large drops uh, from evapor evaporative effects and so on. So. Um, uh, I guess I'm I'm a little bit um, um, still um, suggesting that maybe the the vertical velocity still has an impact on your uh, measured uh, Doppler velocity. Yeah, uh, I mean uh, there has to be an impact because I mean there was a lot of convection produced in this cumulus, and uh, but I think. Uh, I mean, this is just an assumption that like the from the in situ observations, not only at the in cloud leg, but also at the surface level, uh, that uh, the, the values that we were getting was uh, not varying too much. Plus, uh, it was uh, significantly less than the Doppler velocity by itself. That's a crude assumption, but uh, I mean, that's the best that we could do. Yep. And uh, any other questions? I see a comment from Vivek. Thank you. Uh, I agree. Uh, Thank you, Vivek. And any other question? Otherwise, I do have one more question here. So you are referring uh, Connor to Connor's method uh, as the way that you initially did, uh, uh, or that the, um, was it Rienda Gatte did the, um, uh, retrieval of the drop size distributions from the radar data and so on. And you were making the comment that uh, it might also, some of the discrepancy might have to do with aircraft motions and so on, uh, working its way into the signal. And you started out having a pretty big difference between the in situ and the remotely sensed um, rain rates. But when people have used ground-based radars with O'Connor's method, then you don't have the motion from aircraft uh, and so on. And did they typically get a better comparison between, um, say, rain gauges on the ground and radar um, uh, retrieved rain rates? You're asking about uh, how O'Connor approached the problem? Well, or people, other people who have used O'Connor's method, yeah. So not uh, particularly with your data here, but uh, initially at least you were using his method. Mm -hmm. uh... Like um, so, if the if the air aircraft motion uncertainty, like there there has to be some uncertainty in the aircraft motion, and that uh, that is proportional to uh, that that uh, that is added to the uh, um, the uh, spectral width. And uh, since the spectral width, uh, no, it, it has not been, it was not corrected for the aircraft motion and it was used as the uh, input for the retrieval uh, process. So um, I think, I think that's how the uh, error propagation will evolve. Yep. Okay. And Vivek has a second question here. Um, why did you consider rain rate instead of liquid water content retrieval? Um, I did both, but uh, I, I, I stuck to rain rate because uh, rain rate is more commonly used. Uh, yeah, uh, LWC is independent of fall velocities of particles. Uh, yeah, that, that is right. But uh, uh, it's rain rate that uh, we um, 
that is more commonly used in, when precipitation analysis is done even in models uh, but maybe um, what can, can i add a comment to that uh, yeah. which is that uh, in a sense you are interested in the heating rate of the atmosphere and the precipitation is uh, precipitation removal implies that there has been a heating of the atmosphere um, because you had condensation and now you've removed that uh, amount of rain and you're looking at a boundary layer that is uh, warming up and deepening with time. So um, uh, the, the rain rate probably is a better measure if you want to uh, understand how the um, um, what is the impact of precipitation uh, uh, on the development of the boundary layer? Um, hmm. I would think so. Uh, have we got any other questions? And I don't see any more. So can we do a virtual thank you very much and a great talk there. Mampi, thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Yep, you're welcome. And with that, we will end the uh, uh, recording and the presentation here. Thank you very much.